This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, a podcast brought to you by two physical therapists devoted to helping physical therapists and other healthcare providers become better educators to patients, students, the community, and each other by interviewing prominent and passionate people within the realms of healthcare and education. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast is intended literally for educational and entertainment purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based on only one source, and therefore this podcast should not be used as personal medical advice. While care has been taken to ensure accuracy, occasionally mistakes and factual errors can be present, as we are only human. This is our journey on the road to becoming better educators, so get ready with your pen and paper as class is about to begin. On this episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, we got to chat with Associate Professor at the University of the Pacific, Todd Davenport. Todd talks a little bit about the responsibilities of a program director, his journey to becoming a professor, and most importantly, Twitter feuds. And without further ado, here is our interview with Todd Davenport. Welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. My name is Brandon Pollan, and I am joined by my co-host, F. Scott Veal. And today, we are very privileged to bring you Dr. Todd Davenport on the show. Now, Todd Davenport now serves as an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California, where he teaches in the doctoral physical therapy program. Dr. Davenport is a graduate of the University of Southern California's DPT and orthopedic physical therapy residency programs. Todd, thank you so much for coming on the show and speaking to us today and for our listeners. Do you think that there's anything else that our audience needs to know about you that perhaps we didn't go over? Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, this is a, a topic that's definitely near and dear to my heart, as, as I know many of us in the field of, of physical therapy education have really worked hard to you know, kind of get better every day uh, because it's really not about us. Uh, it's not about our content, it's about our students, and it's also about the, the difference that our students are going to make in the lives of their patients. It, I don't know that you've left much out. Uh, I, I'm married. I have three, I have three kids. Uh, they certainly keep me going every day. I want to send a quick shout out to my wife for watching our three little ones so that I can be with you today. And I think that's, that's kind of it to get started. Awesome. Well, we'll give her a shout out as well. Thank you again for letting this awesome guy come on. Todd, do you think you could tell us or walk us through your journey about you know how you came a professor and kind of how that whole journey started for you. Yeah, sure. I I think there's a well-worn cliche that, you know, that even the longest journey begins with a single step. And as I look back on things, I honestly would not have guessed I would be anywhere near sort of where I am and looking ahead, not anywhere near where I want to be. So I kind of started off with the whole idea as a physical therapy applicant that I really liked the idea of the scholarly clinician model. When I applied to PT schools, there weren't a whole lot of DPT programs. That was just sort of a model that really attracted me and that, uh, was I knew that scholarship and I knew that teaching was going to be an important part of my life as a clinician. Kind of fast forwarding ahead a little bit, you know, through my PT education, was a work study student in a lab that was funded by an NIH grant, had the opportunity to engage in some uh, animal research uh, and had a great time doing it. Also uh, engaged with some excellent clinical scholars while I was at USC, all of whom taught me a lot about what it meant to be an academic, balancing teaching and education with the other responsibilities of academia and being a professional. And then through my through my residency program was my first teaching experience with Dr. Cornelia Kulig, Dr. Rob Landell, uh, Dr. Steve Reichel, Dr. Mike O'Donnell, all with USC. I was kind of in the advanced orthopedic curriculum there and really had a, a lot of my formative opportunities in teaching there and, and medical conditions and screening in terms of teaching diagnosis for physical therapists. You know, frankly, when the job came open at Pacific, it was right after the birth of our first child. I think uh, my wife Jean and I were looking for a chance to kind of get out of LA and get a little closer to family and applied to a Pacific and never really thought they were going to hire me, but thought that at the very least I could get a little experience that would help inform me a little later in life and was completely shocked when they when they hired me. So I started at Pacific in the fall of 2007 in their abbreviated, concise doctor physical therapy program, which they've been running since coming up to the DPT. So they've, they've, they've run a 24 to 27 month program, depending on the calendar, uh, ever since. So I've been working in that concise physical therapy education setting that people are sort of starting to come around to for the past 10 or 11 years. Got myself somehow earned tenure, and so now I'm a tenured associate professor Professor, and was just, just appointed as program director. So I'm associate professor, program director, and going up for promotion again, and hopefully that works out. So 
you know, along the way, you know, sort of have had a chance to teach a lot of great people, work with a lot of great people, work on a lot of great research projects, certainly engage in university service, all the things that, you know, a, a sort of a, an academic would be expected to do and have had, had just for the most part, a really good time doing it. Yeah. 10 years, man. Time flies, huh? Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I don't like to talk about it too much because it makes me feel incredibly old, especially the old, old guy in the room on Twitter sometimes. But, but yeah, it's, uh, it really does fly when you're having fun. Well, hey, let's get to the topic of discussion today. Um, what makes a great educator, right? Um, so, Todd, could you tell us um, a little bit about what you would define as a great educator? I think being a great educator can be done from sort of a variety of perspectives, but but all of those perspectives, you know, coalesce around one basic vision, and that is really sort of making sure that the activities, the learning activities and an environment that you provide uh, are for the betterment of the student and for the betterment of our profession. So I think great educators are focused on excellent learning outcomes for students. And excellent learning outcomes aren't necessarily the same as the student always being happy. And so the way that we measure those learning outcomes wouldn't always sort of be fantastic course evaluations, but hopefully by the end of a learning experience that that student would think, wow, yeah, we really learned something. I've taken something away from this experience to be a better physical therapist. Yeah. So a little bit of discomfort and discontent is never a bad thing, huh? You know, I think discomfort and discontent as part of the learning process and part of the learning environment can be constructive if it's controlled. And it's communicated that that this is sort of an expected part of the process, right? So you don't want students sort of floating around there not feeling as though this is this is part of the, ex, the an expected part of the experience but rather that i kind of think about it sort of like 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 cross stitch right so i i don't know how to do this at all but i i sort of have been around people who do and so in cross stitch you're trying to make this great sort of embroidered picture on the front of a you know piece of cloth and on the back is just sort of this knotty, jumbled up mess, right? At least sort of what I've seen. And so, you know, what we're what we're needing to do is to embrace the mess in order to get to the pretty picture on top. Is this a new hobby? I'm just trying to clarify. No, you would know if I ever tried to do cross stitching or needlepoint because, like, I, I would have needles sticking out of my hands. It'd be ugly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Fair great. Enough. Fair enough. Awesome. So. How are some steps that someone can take to become a a better educator and how can that maybe be applied to other venues such as, you know, PTs educating patients, clinical instructors, or maybe even entry level educators because, you know, education in our realm is, there's many different roles that hit that. I think you're right that, that that PT sort of education can be uh, can be thought of from a lot of different perspectives. You know, in addition to you know this focus on the student or this focus on the patient, I think I think teaching needs to be a purposeful exercise uh, in which you know you need to sort of actively think about you know what you're doing and how you're doing it. I also think that you know the whole teaching process needs to be something that you get feedback and mentorship about. That you know, this is this is sort of not the kind of thing that you're going to roll out of bed and be you know be an excellent teacher you know the vast majority of the time. But this really takes effort, and it takes coordination, and it takes the heart to do that. So not only does it sort of take this um, this global view and this heart to get outside yourself and you know think about what's best for the student or think about what's best for the patient. Uh, But it also requires you to coordinate with others, to get feedback and mentorship about what you're saying and how you're saying it. And and through that process, you know, really sort of think of of teaching in a very purposeful way, in a very serious way. And so, you know, if, if a person's interested in, you know, doing something like that, you know, the identification of a mentor becomes really important, right? Someone who uh, has done some thinking about how they uh, educate patients or educate students or educate interns for whatever your role happens to be. I think, you know, from the point of view of clinical education, you know, the whole idea of a credentialed CI uh, makes sense uh, from the point of view of, you know, giving some strategies, give it, getting some purposeful feedback on how you're educating interns and helping them with their patients. From the point of view of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Todd, I'm sorry. Did you happen to go through that credentialed CI course by any chance? 
That's sort of on my bucket list. I haven't because I haven't been as involved in the clin ed component. I've been involved in more classroom and lab, lab teaching in the didactic portion of the DPT program. But it's definitely something that's sort of on my bucket list. Yeah, I, I think I've got an opportunity to do it this August, and I think I might just bite the bullet and go ahead and see what it's all about. I think it's a really excellent idea, and I know that, you know, I've seen some folks kind of banter back and forth that this is just another way to extract money from people and payment from people in exchange for more letters. And, you know, I mean, I think there's space for for criticism like that. But in this particular case, having known folks who have gone through it and having known, you know, some of the people who've run these programs, that there, you know, that, that there's a lot more to it than just that. Yeah. Ironically enough, I don't know if there is letters after the name. I emailed the APTA about it. Uh, just curious, you know, what is the cost? Is it something that has to be renewed annually or is it a one-time thing? Apparently it's a lifetime certification, but I don't know that there's any uh, credentials that go after the name apparently. You know, it's funny because I don't I don't know that that stops people. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely not. But it's it's just one of those unsung things where it's kind of, you know, laying under the radar, laying low. But, oh, by the way, I'm a credentialed uh, mm-hmm. clinical instructor, you know? Right. I, I will guarantee that it's the kind of thing that clinical education programs with which you might work would, would recognize that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. Um, this next question is kind of a two-parter here. So as PTs, you know, we go through a lot of great things throughout our career, helping patients improve their quality of life and their function. Uh, but we also kind of face some problems, including insurance regulations, uh, basically decreased reimbursement, increased documentation times and requirements, uh, high patient volumes. Are there similar struggles to educators within the educational realm? And if so, what are some strategies you've found to overcome them? You know, there's always creep with regard to expectation and there's there's creep with regard to sort of the administrative responsibilities associated with running a physical therapy program. And you know some of those some of those things involve uh, things that are important for accreditation. Some of them are related to uh, institutional strategic planning, and it, you know the, the kinds of things that, that some PT educators deal with, uh, and some PT educators don't. So if you're working directly with a student in clinic, of course you're not going to see this. Depending on your role with the university, if you're a clinical faculty member or non tenure track person, you may or may not deal with this. Chances are, if you're tenure track or tenured, you're going to end up dealing with these uh, these administrative issues at some point or another. Uh, in some capacity, you know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of look at this from the point of view of um, just trying to be as transparent as possible with needs, just like you would with uh, making the business case to hire a new therapist or a new PTA or a new tech. Um, you know, if you can make a business case that it makes sense to do that, uh, then then that that happens. Um, you know, similarly, in the educational realm, uh, we try and make business cases to. You know, sort of our dean and our provost in order to, you know, get the staff and faculty necessary to operate a program. Uh, And, uh, you know, here again, it's it's a lot like the business case of a clinic, uh, maybe just with a slightly different business model. Um, But it's not the kind of thing where if you're asked, you're guranteed. So um, the other thing uh, that so that's one way that we sort of uh, address those administrative issues. Um, The second way that we address those administrative issues is the same as I might teach my students. So I, I sort of teach my students that, yes, you, you, you need to make decisions. And because you'll need to make more decisions during the day, uh, you'll need to get there quick. And so uh, we, we really try to work hard to uh, deal with some of this administrative creep through improving our efficiency wherever, wherever possible. And, and, and mainly because uh, I know that we're spending at the end of the day tuition dollars, and so I want to make sure that if we're, you know, it, it, we're, we're as efficient as we possibly can be uh, with regard to deploying our staff and faculty resources, and in order to, you know, sort of again deal with some of this administ- administrative uh, creep that we've seen occurring. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Follow up question to that, Todd. You know, with the changes that universities are kind of going through in terms of, you know, with the tuition changes and stuff. Uh, what changes are you seeing that's kind of happening that's kind of transitioning down to DPT programs? You know, it's a little hard to say because I kind of feel like sometimes health sciences are, are in a special bubble. So, the, you know, w- with higher education, you're dealing with a slightly different economy of scale for each unit. So, you know, I, I think that the issue arise about whether an undergraduate education 
education as important or is it as important as it used to be or is it as cost effective as it used to be? You know, you're starting to see some of that creep out also in health sciences broadly, medicine, physical therapy, certainly, but you're seeing a little bit less of it. And I think the reason that you're seeing a little bit less of it, you know, from a university perspective is that applicant pools are still strong. We have a lot of applicants for each seat. They're very high quality applicants. And so a lot of the same pressures that you're seeing affect higher education broadly have not sort of trickled down to the health sciences most of the time because, you know, folks still really want to be a PT uh, and they want to get jobs. And so, you know, until some of those forecasts change to be a lot less rosy, I don't know if you're going to see a whole lot of changes outside of maybe trying to optimize the physical therapy educational model. So a lot of the a lot of what you're seeing is less driven by universities and more driven by people in the profession, which is kind of unique, trying to advocate for you know, changes that you know, maybe on paper from a university perspective may not make as much sense. Which, which is kind of an interesting approach that, you know, we're, I think you're seeing a lot of people with regard to, you know, setting up concise programs, trying to be as proactive as they possibly can be in order to sort of see the future and, and be it. So unique to the physical therapy field or allied health science field or medicine in general? In medicine, some rumblings towards more concise medical undergraduate education. So instead of four years, going more to three. But, you know, here again, so that that would make us sort of maybe not unique. The medical schools, for the most part, those are big sort of profit centers for universities. Physical therapy programs generally are not considered big profit centers because they're smaller. They're much more hands-on, intensive, and lab situations. So, um, so faculty costs tend to be a little higher in PT compared to other programs. And so it's a, so it's a little bit different business model. So you are seeing sort of a push, but I don't, you know, maybe I need to be a little bit better read on this, but I don't think you're seeing kind of quite the same push at the rate that you're seeing in physical therapy. Sure. No, absolutely. And I like what you said in terms of, you know, not really getting too much or seeing too much of the problems because there's a really high um, applicant pool. I'm curious what's your thoughts on because with tuition costs overall going up for PT students in general and, you know, the fact that the salaries of PTs isn't really changing, kind of compensate with that growth there. Do you think we're going to see a a shift in terms of like where less people are going to go into it because of a decreased ROI? That's such a good question. If you ask me that on even number days, I might answer that a little bit different than odd number days, but let me just give you what I think right now. I work with our pre-PTs, the faculty advisor for our pre-PT club, and let me say, and, 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 and let me invite you to think back to when you were a pre-PT. You weren't thinking ROI. You were thinking, wow, those PTs are doing cool stuff and I want to I wanna help people. And so, you know, to me, that's what we're going to continue to to see, is that we'll continue to see strong applicant pools that are aided and, and abetted by Yahoo.com, who is constantly putting PT on the top five hot jobs. And so as long as we see that, we're going to continue to see strong applicant pools. The thing to kind of keep in mind is that, you know, you have really well-meaning academic administrators who may be in healthcare but may not know physical therapy well. And so I think our best advocates for sort of some of these issues that, you know, kind of cruise under the surface are going to continue to be the very faculty members working in physical therapy programs to sort of, you know, continue to bring these issues up. And so and I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. With, you know, of course, with there being the even and odd days that, of course, go with any job, do you think you could walk us through the day in the life of a PT professor, including kind of the good and the bad aspects of the job? Yeah, so my days are pretty different from day to day. I have classes that I teach. So I teach our first semester students who I love to teach. I love the process of helping a person who is a really smart, engaged human being learn a little bit more about becoming a physical therapist. So taking someone who really doesn't know a lot about PT and PTs in general, to maybe what they saw in an observation, what they saw in a video, what have you, and really sort of helping them you know, kind of move along in our curriculum. Uh, has has been so much fun. I teach in a lab class. I also teach a lecture class that's sort of 
my fall load. And so I have office hours on some days. I have you know times that I meet with students for independent study who may be pursuing their own scholarship or maybe helping me with mine. And of course, faculty meetings, various different types of faculty meetings from regular departmental faculty meetings that happen about every month to task force that was convened by our president and presided over by our provost, you know, that was sort of more of a university-wide scope. So I don't, I can't say that I have an eight to five. I can say that I work maybe 50, 60 hours a week, but I get to choose which ones that I get to work. And that's great. I wouldn't trade it. I don't know that I've ever had a real bad day teaching. And I know I've had some days that I wish were different that, you know, maybe I wasn't wasn't communicating the content as well as I could or making expectations as clear as I could. But I don't really look at those things as bad things. I look at those as ways to, to grow. But, I mean, it all adds up. The experience is only as good as, you know, sort of your, your self-reflection and your mentorship, you know, to, to help you make it as a positive. So, you know, while I've had classes that maybe didn't go as well as I'd hoped, they've, they've all, I hope, added up to something. <laughs> Well, as physical therapists, you know, we all kind of wear several different hats, you know. How do you deal with trying to balance those hats between working in academia, population health, uh, some of the clinical aspect, and pissing people off on Twitter? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I do some of all of that. I, I want to say that my, my most important roles, the ones that I really prize and value, I think, the most that I, that I have the hardest time balancing would be that of husband and dad. I'll second that. You know, the academia, the population health, the clinical aspect and pissing people off on Twitter, those are you know, those are all sort of worthwhile pursuits in their own rights. But, you know, the, the, the biggest thing is, is sort of work life balance and probably an entire podcast episode in and of itself. How do you I was going to say that's that's a buzzword nowadays. Right. How do you get stuff done and, you know, remain a human being, you know, who interacts with and means something to the people? And I don't always know the answer to that. Most of it's just turn off the laptop, turn off the Twitter machine. You know, I, I don't know that there's ever really a balance. I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do bleeds one into the next in terms of my professional activities. So my, you know, I, I still do some clinical consulting. I'm in uh, outpatient orthopedic practice with Kaiser at least a few hours a week. And that helps kind of balance me a little bit, helps me make the educational realm make sense. And similarly, when I'm at school, it helps make the clinical realm make sense. So I, I really do feel lucky that in that regard, I have different perspectives and distance to be able to sort of reflect and, and make each better. The population health piece is, as you guys know, uh, probably way too much from hashtags and emojis, a huge drum that I've been beating for a while here, you know, just trying to sort of get physical therapy to think outside of its traditional role. I don't know that I necessarily balance that very well. I, I, I'm in the clinic and I see people who have perfectly preventable injuries and I, you know, I'm sort of out in academia teaching students how to think about people as a clinician one at a time instead of necessarily by groups. But I do feel like, you know, my clinical and academic venues give me the leverage to be able to start introducing public health concepts in there. And then, you know, pissing people off on Twitter basically is, you know, if I have a thought, it's just nice to be able to get it out of my head and kind of hopefully it's going to the betterment of something. You know, even if it doesn't, at least it's out of my head and maybe onto somebody else's plate to chew on if they choose to or or to disregard so yeah twitter's a nice kind of sounding board for that kind of stuff isn't it i found that it it's been good for me because i i get a chance to work out ideas that are in my head that normally would just sort of rattle around there but actually have come to some constructive fruition through you know csm panels and you know um and and manuscripts and these kinds of things that ordinarily probably would not have been written but may have been one of those things that you look back five years later and you're like, yeah, that was a really good idea. I wish I would have done something with that. And uh, Twitter gives me a chance to do that. Plus, it just gives me a chance to kind of interact with people who are interesting, have cool things to say, and are smart people. Absolutely. And we have a lot, sure. and there's a lot of good stuff on Twitter to find out. In terms of, you kind of you kind of said this before, Todd, in terms of, you know, looking for someone who's kind of passionate and really self-reflective and growing, but is there a certain type of person you would recommend for the world of academia? Or, if this makes it easier... Or is there a type of person that you would not recommend for a role in academia? That's an excellent question. So so to address the second part, I've always been very much a big tent person. I'd rather see sort of different personalities and different backgrounds, different belief sets in, in sort of the academic world. So I probably wouldn't go out of my way to not recommend academia to people, but but there are some certain, I think, critical personality traits that are important for anybody who's who's interested in academia. The first is you, you have to have a heart for teaching. And and so that, that extends from the, the clinic, the classroom, so where, wherever you are. You have to be a person who wants to receive feedback about 
how they present themselves and how they teach, how they convey and assess, you know, understanding of information. And that stuff's really hard. It's hard to get feedback on that uh, because it goes to your very communication skills, which I think is really linked to who you are as a person. And so that's that's just something to kind of kind of keep in mind. I think you know you, you sort of have to have your priorities straight. I think um, you know there are people in academia who who you know have an agenda and want to do things their way. And I think you know maybe there's there's a place for that. I also think that you know there's there's a much bigger place for making sure that students can achieve their own educational outcomes. They can get licensed uh, if they want to pursue scholarly you know, scholarly goal. That they can do that, and that you know we're sort of there for the student. Uh, we're not so much there for us, but that you know we're able to in, indulge our own you know sort of teaching and scholarly our service interests through the interests of our students. You know, I also think too that it, it's 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 going to be important for a person to be focused. So, you know, my experience in a nutshell was was basically here are the classes you're going to teach, here are the basic departmental committees that you're going to serve on. I'm going to check back in with you in three years and find out how you did. And, uh, you know, the, the rest of that was just sort of was up to me, whether I was on track to tenure or whether I was going to lose lose track. And, of course, I, I had the opportunity for mentorship that I availed myself of along the way. But, you know, you at the end of the day, a plan that you need to enact for yourself. And so you do have to have some vision of where you want to be, you know, and how that vision sort of interacts with where you are. Either this is a clinical setting or this is, a, you know, more of an academic uh, educational setting to make sure that your goals converge with the institution's goals. Uh, so again, that ability to, to remain goal focused, even despite many different paths, I think is going to be really important. So those would be kind of the three things that, that I would say a person, you know, seeking a, a role in academia should consider. Very cool. Going back to that student-centered way of thinking, um, what are some of the best tactics that you commonly use uh, when teaching in order to try to keep students motivated, engaged, and focused? You know, so I, I've i read some some studies that suggest that we have our students' attention span for, for a disappointing amount of time. Uh, it, it's measured in, in minutes and not hours. And I, and I don't blame students for this one bit because ha after having been a student just recently finishing my, my MPH, I, I, I reminded myself how, how bad that can be. So I do try and sort of hit the refresh button if this is this is lecture. I use humor a lot. Might come as a shock to you guys, but I'm pretty sarcastic. And so I like to just drop in a comment or eight to see who's paying attention. And I think that that sort of helps by the time because I think every time someone rolls their eyes or maybe even smirks, I know they're hearing me and I get a reset on my few minutes of attention span. The other thing that I like to do, especially in my lecture courses, is I like to bring in manipulable objects. So in my kinesiology course, I have bone boxes. And so if we're talking about the tibial femoral joint, of course, I'll bring in the, you know, the femur and the tibia, right? So that they can play with it. So that they're looking at, you know, maybe a projected image of something I want them to appreciate. But, you know, they also have the opportunity to manipulate the bones at their tables. And then I'll usually sort of sneak in a about every, about every hour or so, some kind of a team assignment where they have to take five or 10 minutes and do something to apply you know, the information that I, that, I, that I just went over in a lecture. I do the same kinds of things in my lab courses where I really do try to, you know, to, to try and inject a little humor. I like to make sure that people are moving around, but they've got just enough lecture and demonstration to feel anchored. I've used you know, handouts to, to give people sort of um, you know, something that they need to be accountable to to provide a backbone structure to the, to the, the lab experience uh, that will have the educational objectives on there so they know exactly what they're supposed to get out of it and that I let them know that they are accountable to that. And if they feel like that they're not getting it anytime, they can raise their hand and say, so what? That is my favorite question. So what? Why are we learning this? I don't understand how this fits. And so then we, we can address that, those issues as they come up. And so, you know, to that point, and especially in my, my clinical courses, I really try and bring in formally and informally patient case studies, small stories, funny, funnier the better, uh, that help reinforce the key concepts and uh, of, of that particular lab day and just sort of keep people excited about becoming a PT. Awesome. Awesome. And kind of as a follow up with that. Are there any methods of teaching that you have found to be not as effective or ways of teaching that are becoming out of date? I, re I affectionately refer to this manner of teaching as death by PowerPoint. Yes. Yes. I have, 
Sometimes, sometimes it's still the best delivery method, but I really have a hard time doing it. it it's, you know, it, it, where you're just sort of talking at people. You, you know, you want to give people a complete set of notes, and so you run the risk of looking like you're reading your slides. You know, these are, these are not the things that will keep people's attention spans. And, you know, like I said, I think sometimes, you, you know, you have a hard time finding alternate ways to do it. There's always alternate ways to do it, but you need to be, I think, as an educator, respectful of students out of class prep time, that time is finite, that the real learning takes place outside the classroom. And the more you give people in the way of flip classrooms and flip methodologies and different, different things uh, of that nature, the more out of class prep time is required from the student's perspective, which then could adversely affect assimilation of the material. Uh, unless it's done in a very coordinated way, which kind of goes back to this whole idea of making sure you're on the same page with your fellow faculty members. I think at any, any time that you assume knowledge, it's probably not going to go well. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't know something or doesn't remember something, and so it's good to make sure that you're constantly reorienting people to how this builds and what they already know and how this is different and new. And so again, this is where knowing your faculty, knowing the people who teach the, the content that points to your course is important. Then also understanding where there are redundancies in your curriculum where you're just repeating somebody something that somebody else said. Um, maybe verbatim. And so, so those, would be, those would be some things that I think are not very effective. So just lecturing people to death, repeating a bunch of stuff, and you know, sort of maybe not sort of pointing out the relevance, maybe not pointing out how this is, this is the, the information they're learning is new, different, or important. How do you think that kind of depends also on the type of content that you're presenting, whether it be like more conceptual based compared to more lab based? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you're in a lab course, you know, there's the opportunity for more show and tell, more clinical applicability. So for lecture courses, I do think you have to work a little harder at it. I also think, though, that there are certain things uh, that, that you sort of just need to get across at, you know, sort of a first layer of familiarity that might be conducive to lecture, even though it's a bit painful. And I'm thinking of a course that I teach actually in medical conditions and screening, and I'm actually teaching it now, not right this second, I'm talking to you guys, but I'm teaching it this semester or summer, summer semester. We actually have it broken up into three sections, and two of those sections are pretty heavy lecture based, but that third section is much more clinical reasoning, lab, small group based. And so we're trying to work in, you know, at least some pairing and sharing methodology in with with a class that could be a lot of rote memorization and you know sort of a lot of, of of just death by PowerPoint. But to your point, Todd, I mean, you do need some of that foundational structure a lot of the time. Um, what is it, Vygotskyanism, where you know, kind of like a scaffolding, where you build them up and you kind of give them that foundational structural knowledge, and then you can kind of tear it down and let them fly solo after that, right? Yeah, I think to to a large extent that's true, and you know we we sort of have our our whole curriculum is is a little bit structured like that. Where and you, this isn't uncommon in, in in I think physical therapy educational curricula, where early on you're going to get a lot of you know lecture based memorization type courses, anatomy, physiology come to mind. But by the end, you're using that anatomy and physiology in very functional ways. You know, where take a lot of clinical reasoning. You know, I think that's not totally unique. What what I think is important though is that even when we're I just find students remember things they can apply. And it's really just as simple as that. And, and you know, I don't think you can discount the value of a good story. Yeah, I think in, in order to put it into context, we need that story. We need something relatable so that we can kind of take the information and make it relevant to us on a personal level. Absolutely. I, I've had students come back to me and say, you know, I, I wouldn't have remembered that fact except for your dumb story. And that, that's actually the highest compliment I've ever received as an educator. Mission accomplished. Well, Todd, this has been a, an exceptionally informative talk. I appreciate you coming on tonight. Um, we're going to probably wrap up with this last question that we ask everybody. Uh, if you could change one aspect of higher learning and, and higher education, DPT or otherwise, which aspect would that be and why? Yeah, this is a scary question because I have thought about this. Uh, you sent this question ahead to me uh, to me ahead of time, and I, I still don't know exactly how I'm going to answer it. So I'm going to just give it a shot. You, you know, we have so many people on on university campuses in general, in clinics, clinical education settings, people doing staff mentorship, uh, staff orientations, 
you know, if people in residency and fellowship programs who are really bright people who all have something unique to add. And I, I think in higher education as education anywhere, we sort of fall into the trap of having sort of this mental image of what an educator ought to be or or, or you know, should talk like, should sound like, should be like. And I'm, I'm very cautious of that. I'm cautious of the silos. And when I talk about silos, I'm not talking about silos just in terms of, of discipline, but I'm also talking about silos of life experience, of demography. If it's one thing that I could somehow change that I don't have an answer to because I, 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 I like these big picture questions, it would be that. That you know, we would somehow break down the silos, you know, of the voices that students, that interns, that residents and fellows get to hear, and that we would be able to benefit from, you know, the message of the diversity of backgrounds and of life experiences. That's uh, kind of like, in, I, I like to call it uh, interdisciplinary trespassing, kind of a word that I've been using for a couple of years now. I didn't come up with it, but it's it's a great term because it just shows that we can learn so much from so many different disciplines and you know there, it shouldn't be sectioned off that like that you know there, there's no reason for that so yeah i, I love Great that insight. point yeah fantastic thanks well todd thanks again for coming on and taking the time uh definitely shout out to your wife uh mine as well she's doing the same as yours watching the kids so we can come on and do this um yeah hopefully we can have you on again in the future to talk some more education yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely love it. And, you know, thank you and, and, and Brandon for uh, for starting this podcast. I, I hope it reaches the ears of a lot of folks. And you know, certainly the mission is sound. And, and I hope it helps people who are trying to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit to find out how academia works, either to get into it or just to understand it a little bit better. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's part of our goal. But thank you again so much, Todd, for coming on. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate the chance to do it. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, Extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.